very close to my heart. Um, and since I'm uh, not speaking very often, uh, I, I took my Bible and took the sermons that I enjoy the most and uh, put them in here. And of course, these sermons, they, they grow as they go along. Each time I have given the message, I'll add something to it or so, so something more up to date or something that God has shared with me that I want to share with you. But this particular sermon, uh, I entitle it, A Midnight Revival Meeting. And the first time that I preached it, according to my records, is in 1976 in Colorado Springs at Galley Road Baptist Temple. And uh, then I've spoken it in Beat uh, Beatrice, Nebraska, Farmington, New Mexico, Moreno Valley, California, Springdale, Arkansas. And what really got my attention is this is the message that I preached when the pulpit committee of Meyer Lane Baptist Church came and heard me speak. And that's this church, by the way. Uh, Meyer Lane is the legal name, and we go by, uh, of course, Baptist Church of Redondo Hills now. But this is the message that those pulpit committee members uh, heard me speak on. And uh, from there, they invited us to come and have me preach in view of a call to the church. That was in 1990. And let's see, where else? Uh, I preached in Hanford, California. What's that? I was born that year. <laughs> oh, you were? Okay, I know how old you are now. Uh, okay, and then I spoke in Sterling, Colorado, uh, this message as well. So some of these messages just mean something special uh, to me, and as I'm closing in, you know, and, I, and I'm pretty well, I'm still uh, a co-pastor here at this church. Uh, I'm still not, I'm not, Pastor Emeritus, which would mean I wouldn't have, you know, wouldn't be part of the leadership anymore, but I'm still a pa co-pastor of the church. Uh, but I've asked Pastor John to, to be the lead with messages and all of that kind of thing. And so it gives me an opportunity to speak and do other things. And we will be taking a vacation uh, next month. So we'll be gone about three Sundays on vacation to Colorado. Uh, and uh, on July the 4th, I'll be in Sterling with my brother Dylan and they have a big get together. Usually several hundred people come together and they've asked me to do the Star Spangled Banner to begin with and, and then uh, do some patriotic type songs. So I'm looking forward to that and appreciate your prayers. But let's get right into it here. Acts 16 and our text is from verse 16 through 34 which says it came to pass as we went to prayer a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us. Now, of course, Luke was uh, the writer of uh, Acts, and so that's why he was the personal physician to Paul. So that's why he says, and us, and cried, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which showed or show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her, and it came out the same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes, commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight... Let's read verse 25 and together in unison. And at midnight... Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Now I'm going to read the rest of it. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison bars open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before 
Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake with him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, this account just thrills my heart. It's, a, it's tr obviously one of my favorite scriptures. There are many things we learn from it. Uh, Paul and Silas, these men of God, were thrown into prison because of their stand for Christ. They had been preaching contrary to the established religion of that day. Now in verse 25, we find them in the inner prison in stocks. Not only were they in a, like a solitary confinement, uh, but the, the jailer and those in, in authority were taking extra, extra precaution. They even had their feet in stocks. They couldn't get up and freely walk around in that little place uh, in solitary confinement. And then at midnight, something happened. And it wasn't, uh, you know, they, we'll talk about this later, the, the song was sang. It wasn't jailhouse rock, but God did something, didn't he? <laughs> he rocked the jailhouse. There's no question about that. And, man, what a tremendous revival they had that night in the jailhouse. Midnight revival meeting. Three things. They prayed, they sang praises, and the prisoners heard them. And that's what I want to just present to you this morning from this message. First of all, prayer was made. Uh, certainly, we believe in prayer. Now, how much we practice it, that's another question. Prayer was made. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. Now, they knew when to pray because it was at midnight in the jailhouse. I mean, they were in a peck of trouble, someone might say. And uh, they prayed. There are a lot of times good to pray. Matter of fact, there's never a good time not to pray. Exactly. <laughs> pray without ceasing. Uh, they prayed. And they followed the Lord's instructions. He spoke a parable unto them to this end. Then men ought always to pray and not to faint. And that's in Luke 18 verse 1. And verse Thessalonians 5, 16, I just mentioned that. Pray without ceasing. We ought to always pray. Never quit praying. Philippians 4, and Philippians, the main theme was joy. The epistle of the Philippians. That's the theme of that book of the Bible. And uh, in connection to joy, you've got to have prayer life. You've got to be a prayer warrior. He said in verse uh, 6 of chapter 4, be careful for nothing or anxious for nothing. Don't worry. But in everything, not just some things, or not just in most things, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Let God know all of your requests, because that reveals what's on your heart. That reveals your innermost being. And he said as a result in verse 7 of Philippians 4, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, so keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It has been said, I don't know of anyone personally, but, but it has been said that there have been people who were in a mental institution that simply put this to practice and their minds were steadied and they were able to overcome their difficulties just simply by really praying, learning to pray and leaving their problems and uh, things like that with God because it says here, the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts, yes, but also minds through Christ Jesus. Now what is prayer? Prayer in essence is talking uh, to the Lord, isn't it? It's talking to God. And then the Bible study that we want to do 
is uh, reading, studying, and meditating is God talking to us. So prayer is talking to God. Not just asking, but asking is a big part of it. We have not because we ask not. But prayer is more than that. Prayer is worshiping God, loving God, telling Him how much we love Him. And uh, we ought to do that first before we ask for anything, I believe. That's kind of ungrateful just to come to ask. But we need to worship God in prayer. And then when we go to the Bible, God's holy word, that's God speaking to us. When we meditate, when we learn scripture like the Awanas do, memorization, uh, these are ways that God speaks to us. You know, you can't have a conversation if it's just one way. If you stand there and I just talk to you and you never talk to me, that's not a conversation. We need to, we need to have a conversation with God. And if it's just prayer, that's only one of us talking. And, and you're not going to really be much of a Bible student until you learn to pray. Because not only does God want to speak to us through his word, but he tells us and commands us many, many times to talk to him. We have a model prayer in uh, Matthew 6, verses 8 through 13. Most people refer to it as the Lord's Prayer. But in reality, uh, I don't look at it as the Lord's Prayer. It's the model prayer or the disciples' prayer. Uh, if I were to call a prayer the Lord's Prayer, it would have to be when he was praying in the garden and making his con uh, plead to the Father, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless not by will but thine be done. He, he uh, prayed to the Father. But this is a model prayer. It teaches us how to pray. Uh, in uh, Matthew 6, verse 8, Be ye not uh, therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him after this manner. Therefore pray ye. And, it, and you know how it goes? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And that's a way we learn to pray, to be thankful to him, uh, be in awe of him, reverence of God, when we pray, don't just rush into his presence and out of his presence, but pray all the time. Uh, pray without ceasing. And when we have a special need and special time, get alone with God and speak to him. And then look forward to have him answer us because that's the two-way conversation. Matthew 7, the next chapter, Matthew 7, 7 and 8, ask and it shall be given you. Seek. And you shall find, and I hope that you're taking the notes there in your bulletin, writing these references down. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone, I like that, everyone that asketh, uh, or that asketh, receiveth. There it is. Everyone that asketh, receiveth. Someone said, I haven't had an answer to prayer. Well, are you praying? Well, no. Well, then why expect an answer if you're not praying, if you're not asking? Uh, and he that seeketh, findeth. It's wonderful to seek and to find. And uh, him that knocketh, it says, him that knocketh, it shall be open. The door is going to open. Thank God for that. That was before we had the doorbell, wasn't it? Some of these doorbells, they kind of, they make so much noise. I, I have to confess, one of them I unhooked because <laughs> it, uh, it, it would disturb me right in the middle. <laughs> and, and the dog would start barking, so I figured, well, uh, but you know what I'm talking about. Back used to be, and when I go visiting over the years, I'd go up to the door and then ring the doorbell. If I didn't hear it ring, then I would knock because I want to make sure that it would work and I can see why now some of them work. In Acts 4.31, now, these people meant business with God. How many of us mean business with God? I mean, when we pray, we expect something great to happen. We've seen some great things happen in our lives over the years, and we continue to see some wonderful things happen. Uh, back a few months ago, uh, 
some of the most astounding things happened in prayer that I didn't really expect the way it was going to work out. But God was on, he's on the throne and it worked out. And, and I've told some people that that was some of the greatest answers to prayer that I can remember. But before that, there were several times. Uh, we prayed for our son's healing, but God had a different idea. He healed him, but it was a different way than I expected. Took him on to heaven. Uh, and then there was the time when uh, there was a church uh, up for sale in Colorado Springs, matter of fact. And some of the men, we decided, I really felt impressed that we were supposed to do this. Uh, and so we went out and we walked around the building and got down on our knees out there right next to the church building and said, Lord, we're asking that you give us this property. And the Lord knew our hearts. And sure enough, it wasn't long till someone called me and things happened and God gave us back that property. Thank God. God answers prayer if we'll ask and if we'll believe. Uh, it says there in uh, Acts 4.31, when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. See, that's the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. You speak the word of God with boldness. You're not ashamed to speak out. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So these people prayed and the place was shaken. They had a, probably an earthquake there, I would think. They were assembled together and they were all filled and they spoke the word of God with boldness. You know, God can shake us. He has me and my name shook, you know. And uh, so he can shake us and get our attention, can't he? It may be an earthquake of a different way than a geological type that we have out here sometimes. And let me tell you this, God wants us to come boldly to him and pray. Hebrews 4, 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. See, Jesus had already gone back and the epistle of Hebrews talks about the priesthood of the believer a lot and about Jesus being our high priest here. Uh, He's passed to the heavens. Jesus, Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. That's where he is right now. He's at the right hand of the Father, seated there, interceding for us in verse 14. And I don't know how much longer he'll be there. He's, one of these days he's going to get up, and Gabriel's going to take that trump and going to blow it. And we're going to be gone, thank God. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with a feeling of our infirmities. How many times you've talked to someone and you went away and said, man, they didn't even act like they cared. Lots of, right? Uh, but Jesus, because of his going through what we're going through when he was here on earth, in his flesh that he, did, that he had, he's touched when we stumble, we fall. He's touched. Not very many people may be, but he is. And, and mothers, speaking about that, they're the most like God, aren't they, that way? And Mother's Day last week. But was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted just like I am. He was tempted just like you are. For men, it might be the lust of the flesh, the lust of a, of a, of a woman. It might be something else. But for, and for all of us, there's the temptations in our lives about pride, being lifted up in pride and wanting to be uh, lifted up rather than letting God do it. We try to do it ourselves. And yet he never sinned. Thank God. And in verse 16, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, 1 Timothy 2, 5, there's one God and one mediator between God and men. Who is it? That's it. Jesus. The man Christ Jesus. He's the only mediator. So why not pray? We're really shooting ourselves in the foot, <laughs> literally. <laughs> in a way, if we're not praying, I mean, God said to do it, and he's going to bless us, so we're just robbing ourselves. And then Jeremiah, in the Old Testament, said, call unto me, and he's telling what God's saying here, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not, even beyond our expectation. James 4, 2 
I mentioned part of it earlier. Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Did you know that all of us are flawed? We hear that expression, I'm a flawed person or they're a flawed person. All of us are. All of us are sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why would God even think of answering our prayer? Well, it's only because of the grace of Almighty God. Then I love this parable in Luke 18. The parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's a word, it's a truth running parallel, parable with a greater truth. So the Lord used a lot of parables, uh, illustration, if you might want to call it. And so here's one that... Uh, we could update just a little bit. I know the Lord wouldn't mind us doing that since this is a parable. If it was something else, he wouldn't want us to do that. But here's a parable. He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray, not to faint, saying there was a city, a judge. In this city there's a judge, got it? Which feared not God, neither regarded man. He was a, a bad judge. Won't go ahead and say anything else. There was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. Now, here's a widow. She's all alone. Her husband's passed on. She comes and says, Someone's doing me wrong. Avenge me of mine adversary to this judge. And he would not for a while. He wasn't going to do it. He, he wasn't a good judge. And... Uh, Afterward, he said within himself, though I fear not God, nor regard man. He said, I don't fear God. No, he's, not, he's a bad judge. Doesn't fear God. And he doesn't have any really use for man. It's just all for himself. So, uh, in verse 5, yet. Now think about the power of prayer here. Because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will adjudge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Can you imagine this? Here's this judge. This woman comes and says, Avenge me of mine adversary. And the judge says, Get out of here. I don't have any time for you. I'm not going to do that. Did she give up? No. Did she quit asking? No. Every time he'd go to the mailbox, here's a letter, he'd open it up. Avenge me of my adversary. He'd throw that thing down. <laughs> I wish she'd leave me alone. And then she'd go to the, her favorite computer and she'd get on there and open up her email. And there's a hundred emails. Avenge me of my adversary. Avenge me. And he'd put them in spam, but it never worked. It'd keep coming back. And he, and again and again and again, this woman was sending him an email. And then he went to his phone, and sure enough, there was a text message. She got his phone number somehow. I don't know how, but he was mad because I <laughs> avenge me of my adversary. Then she went to the fax machine. There it was again, avenge me of my adversary. And then she walked by his house with a sign, avenge me of my adversary. I mean, she kept asking and asking. And, and that judge, he said, man, I about to pull my hair out. I can't take this anymore. She just won't leave me alone. And so she said, he sent for her and had her come in and said, where is that rascal? I'm going to take care of him. <laughs> and the Lord Jesus was trying to teach us something here and he did a good job of it. Uh, we're, to been, we're to ask God over and over and he wants the best for us. That judge didn't want the best for that widow, but he still took care of her adversary. And if you and I will continue to pray continually over and over and over, I think we believe stronger about prayer than just about anything and practice it less than about anything. Oh, how God's people need to learn to pray. Just keep asking and asking and believing God for what he wants to happen. So we have prayers were made, and then secondly, praises were sung. And this is so important. A lot of times we minimize praises, singing and we, we know that prayer is important. But did you know praises are just about as important? Because the Bible says over and over about that. It says the believer can have a song at night. These things write uh, we unto you that your joy may be full. 1 John 1, 4. He said in Psalm 42, verse 8. 
Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night his song shall be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. Many times at night I, I just put on the, some kind of real easy listening type music to kind of soothe me a little bit. I mean, when you go to sleep, you know, you want to sleep at night. Something like that really helps. And uh, Christian music, you know, the lyrics, that's the most important thing about a song. When you listen to good songs, it makes a difference. If the Christian, now hear me, if a Christian does not have a song, something's wrong. <laughs> Who else can have a song in the night? Who else can have a song when things are going rough? When one is saved, it causes rejoicing. And the Bible says in Luke 15, 10, it causes rejoicing in the presence, now get this, in the presence of his angels. What, who would that be? In the presence. Oh, my mom, my dad, Robert, Patrick, two grandmothers, and I could name off a bunch of preachers, a bunch of other people that are there, presence of the angels right now. And every time someone gets saved on earth, especially one of their loved ones, they, if there, there's no gold dust there because the streets are gold all the way through, transparent, you can look right through, so they won't be kicking up gold dust. But they, they make a lot of joy in heaven over every, every time somebody gets saved on earth. Amen. <laughs> this is real stuff, folks. And so there's rejoicing in the presence. Now, the angels, they really don't sing much. They don't know what it's like to be lost and then to be saved and so on. They were created differently than human beings. And so if there's rejoicing, there's probably some singing. I would think so. And is there still rejoicing and singing? The man, it's interesting to note the man that's called, the man after God's own heart, David, played a harp. And that's beautiful. The harp makes the most beautiful music. David was a musician, and uh, that means something to me. In Psalm 137, verses 1 through 4, I want you to listen to this very closely because if your song isn't there in your heart anymore, if you don't have a song in your life and you don't want to praise God anymore, now listen to this. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we rem uh, remembered Zion. Slow down, lips. Uh, we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. See the harps that they'd been playing? They hanged them up. For there they carried us away captive, required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. Now, this is interesting because the Jewish people know how to sing and dance and rejoice in the Lord. I mean, they, you get some good Jewish music on there and you'll know what I, find out what I mean. I mean, they know how to dance and praise God and sing and uh, whoo. <laughs> I used to be able to dance a little more, but I, I'm having a hard time uh, slowing down. But the last verse of that, Psalm 137, verse 4, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land. They'd been taken captive. They couldn't sing anymore. They weren't home anymore in the Lord's land anymore. They were taken captive and they lost the ability to sing for the Lord. Oh, how we need to praise God. David and the other writers wrote songs of joy and praise. And he said in Psalm 89, 1, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. And it is a good thing in Psalm 92, 1, to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O my most high. Most people, when they get real happy, I used to see uh, at home, my mother could really get, you know, if she got happy or something, she'd do a little jig in the kitchen there. And she used to do that, I think it was a Mexican hat dance, I think is what it's called. And my dad would just love to see her do that. She'd come through the kitchen doing that little dance. And, uh, oh, that was fun. And that made the kids happy and laugh. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a good time in the Lord. Did you know that? And if you're having a good time in the Lord and somebody looks down on you, hey, we're supposed to be that way. Have a good time in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. 
And uh, Psalm 95, 1, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Sometimes we just make a noise. Maybe we don't sing on pitch. Well, go ahead and make a noise. <laughs> we can do that much. And uh, I waited patiently for the Lord and inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth even praise unto our God. Someday there's going to be a new song. It tells us about it in Revelation 5, 9. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. That's enough to sing about. That's going to happen one of these days. Prayer was made in that jailhouse. And then praises were sung, and then they had that midnight revival meeting, and uh, the results of those two things brought point number three, the prisoners heard them. The prisoners heard them, Acts 16, 25. Sometimes the prisoners don't hear us because we aren't praising God. Sometimes they don't hear us because we're not praying. Those that are prisoners in their sin, that's all the people who are lost. They don't hear us because... We've lost our joy. We've lost our effectiveness. But people, God's people, ladies and gentlemen, we can go back there and reclaim it today. We can have revival. That's what revival is. I'm going to get that song back. It's not, uh, a revival isn't just for the lost. It's for the saved, most of all, to stir up the life that we already have. And so the prisoners heard them in verse 25 of Acts 16. And that's most important. You and I are saved to serve, share salvation with others, and we're selfish if we don't. Every lost person's a prisoner. Let's take the gospel to them. It's necessary to pray and sing praises to get them to listen to us. And at midnight, we may have the prisoners hear us, even at midnight. And at midnight now, I believe, the Lord's coming is drawing nigh. Did you know that people can be converted to Christ any time? That doesn't depend upon the weather, conditions, the feelings, the occupation, the education, situation. Today, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And in verses 26 through 34, the results, suddenly there was a great earthquake, it says. And it comes down to tell the, the uh, attitude that the jailer had toward Paul and Silas. It's interesting to note, too, that everyone in there heard them, not just the jailer, but all the other inmates, if you please. They heard this song. I would imagine, Paul and Silas, I doubt that they sang the jailhouse rock, <laughs> but I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't say, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And we see that the earthquake took place and the jailer had been charged to keep these guys locked up and in stocks. And when he realized that that earthquake had taken place and that the doors of the, of the cells were all open, he just assumed that all the people were gone. I mean, <laughs> wouldn't you think so? <laughs> and so he got his sword out. No use for me to live anymore because they'll kill me anyway, those that were over here. So I'm just going to end it all right here. And Paul called out and said, Do thyself no harm. We're all here. And I, So the other prisoners were there too. And I, that's, that's amazing what God did here. And the jailer, you know what he did? <laughs> he fell at the, uh, he just fell before them. And, and he said, What must I do to be saved? How in the world did he know to ask that? I can tell you how. <laughs> I'm almost certain. <laughs> when Paul and Silas were being led down there, Paul said, Mr. Jailer, are you saved? If you died today, do you know that you'd go to heaven? 
And the jailer didn't pay much attention at the time. Paul said, uh, I'm going to tell you about that light that's shown on that road to Damascus and how that I met the Lord. He said, I want you to know God has done some great things for me and my family and, and so on. And so Paul sowed the seed. And when the earthquake took place, they were right there. And that jailer, he knew to ask, what must I do to be saved? And then Paul and Silas, they, they had the answer too. He said, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. The whole house is going to be saved. And so he washed their stripes. They, were had, they had been beaten and they went to his house because of the great change that was taken in their life. And immediately they got baptized. He and his whole house got baptized. They all professed Christ publicly. Get the picture. Here's a jailer who was charged to keep them safely and all of that and now he ends up joining the group and becomes a convert. Paul and Silas. Sometimes it looks like there's not much hope but with the Lord there's always hope. That song says give the winds a mighty voice Jesus saves Jesus saves let the nations now rejoice Jesus saves Jesus saves shout salvation full and free highest hills and deepest caves this is our song of victory Jesus saves Jesus saves give the winds echo it, 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 and the wind is the holy spirit he takes the message we give to him and he spreads it all over the place the wind of the holy spirit oh how we need to pray and we need to sing praises and if we do the prisoners well, here's, we saw that happen last Sunday. One that came and received Christ. Others who prayed had needs met. And it can happen now too. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for thy word, for the Holy Spirit who speaks to us through it. And if there is someone here without Christ, may they make that decision today in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Is there someone that would say, Pastor David, I need your prayer. I'm not sure that I'm saved. I want to be certain that my heart is right with God, that I'm a child of God through the new birth. Pray with me and for me that I might have my heart, everything just right before him. Would you slip your hand up if God has spoken to your heart? Is there anyone that needs to have prayer for baptism or church membership possibility? Yes, God bless you. Thank you. Anyone else? Just slip your hand up and pray with me about that. Do you have a lost loved one that's on your heart right now and you want us to pray together for them that they'll come to know Jesus? Yes, here's someone. Anyone else? And there's another one. Amen. Precious Lord God, thank you for these requests. Lord, may you do a work in each heart and life as far as meeting that particular need. And especially we do pray that those who are in our hearts that need to be saved, that you would use us as an instrument to first of all pray for them, but also to share with them the good news of Christ and eternal life. We thank you for all things in Jesus' precious and holy name. And everyone said together, amen. 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 God bless each one. Uh, John.